This is a special one-hour edition of Face the Nation with Prime Minister Golda Meir in Israel and a second half hour live from Washington with White House Chief of Staff General Alexander Haig. First, Prime Minister Meir. Prime Minister Meir, President Nixon has said that this is the best chance for true peace in the Middle East in at least 20 years. Do you believe that out of this latest war a real and lasting peace can be brought? I can't be sure. As far as we are concerned, it should have been 25 years ago. It should have been in 56. It should have been in 67. It should have been in 69. I mean, if it was necessary to fight a war and for our Arab neighbors to lose in order to bring about peace, they had these opportunities. I hope uh, that this will happen this time. But it depends entirely upon them whether they really think that peace is more important than fighting a war. I'm not even saying winning a war, because that they have never experienced, thank God. But it seems that it's more important for them to fight a war, even if they lose it, than uh, to make some step towards peace. With all my heart, I hope that this time it will be different. In Tel Aviv, Israel, Face the Nation, a spontaneous and unrehearsed news interview with the Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir. Mrs. Meir will be questioned by Terence Smith of the New York Times, CBS News correspondent George Herman, and CBS News correspondent Tom Fenton. Face the Nation is produced by CBS News, which is solely responsible for the selection of today's guest and panel. What President Nixon said was that there was the best chance for peace. He made no statement that there would be a real peace, but that there was the best chance for peace. Do you estimate that, uh, from what you learned, that there is this chance for peace among the Arabs as well as among the Israelis? Would I read the, the only thing that I can honestly say is that we hope so. Because so far, from uh, the Syrians and the Egyptians, there was not one single word said that uh, one can say, well, look, this is something new. But I hope so. We, we can never uh, make up our minds that there's no hope for peace. And certainly we shall do everything within our power to make it possible. Mrs. Mayor, when um, this, this whole prospect of negotiations is, is uh, thought of to come in the near future, can you tell us when and where and under what auspices Israel would like to see these talks begin? As far as when and where is considered, as far as we're concerned, every hour is the good hour to begin. Every place in the world is the good place to meet. And under what auspices? Under the, uh, what auspices? We'll listen and we'll make up our minds. And I don't think there'll be any trouble in the office as far as that's concerned either. Mrs. Mayer, before the war, Israel seemed to be moving towards greater independence from the United States in terms of arms and uh, was moving towards self-sufficiency. In view of what's happened now, do you think this is a realistic goal in the next few years? Um, I don't think this is exactly true. It's true that um, we have been be uh, becoming uh, more and more self-sufficient in arms, but it, was, it wouldn't be true we say that we were self-sufficient. And we got a lot of uh, help from the United States in allowing us to buy arms from the United States even before. Uh, but uh, now I think we will have to do two things. We will have to produce more on our own and probably ask our friends uh, to sell us more even in the future, as long as there isn't a realistic hope for peace. Because uh, I think, I don't know whether it was necessary uh, for additional proof to the world what our situation is, supposing that we did not have the arms that we had, supposing that our men were not as they are, what would have happened to us? As you possibly move into negotiations, are you concerned about this great dependency on the United States? Uh, maybe it's semantics, but instead of calling it dependency, I would like to see it rather in a relationship of friendship, friendship between, you know, two equals, the United States and Israel, 
far as size is concerned and so on. But uh, seriously speaking, I would like to see it as a question of, as a matter of friendship and the understanding of the largest power in the world that a small nation, no matter how small, should not be at the mercy of anybody that wants to bully us. Mrs. Mayor, the... And I think it's as important for the United States as it is for Israel. It certainly is as important for the world. If Israel can be bullied by others and everybody else standing aside, that's happened in history before. Czechoslovakia was offered... But you had a speech to the Knesset in which you outlined three dangerous things. You said that a ceasefire arranged by the superpowers, and I believe you said mainly in their own interests, is a dangerous thing. A world in which Israel has lost most of its former enthusiastic friends is a dangerous thing. And you were referring to other nations besides the, not the United States, but to other nations. And then, of course, enemies who possess most of the world's oil is a dangerous thing. Now, those first two dangerous things, I think, are the ones we're interested in. One in which you have lost the support of many small nations who were friends of yours before, and one in which you talk about a ceasefire arranged not by you, but by superpowers for their interests. Uh, look, I don't equate the two superpowers. It does not mean that we do not, from time to time, have uh, differences of opinion, sometimes rather painful ones, with the United States. I don't want to paint this as uh, an idyllic uh, picture. The United States has its interests. We have ours. I think most uh, uh, phases of uh, interest, as far as peace is concerned and so on, we are at one. But these are two different uh, nations. Uh, so I wouldn't want to equate the Soviet Union, for instance, with the United States. That would be absolutely unfair and, I think, uh, not, uh, not truthful. But uh, it's true. It would be much better if the Egyptians, and we had arranged it, but if, as long as the Egyptians don't want to do a thing of that kind, there's no... Uh, but now you are talking. You've had a meeting of military officers between Egypt and Israel. Is that a breakthrough? Is that a start of something real? This is the first time that something like this has taken place. We suggested it. We were very happy it was accepted. Uh, from what I heard this morning, and I haven't yet a full report, uh, the atmosphere at, re at any rate was good. Uh, there are possibilities, and I, I think uh, realistic possibilities for future meetings. Now, if you want me to say, does this mean that it leads directly to peace it, it quickly? I can't okay, say that, lovely. but it's a good start. Is it, is it a, I hope so. It is a good start. It's a start that people begin to talk. Has it, uh, Mrs. Mayer, been followed by any assurance to you from Dr. Kissinger or any other source that, in fact, the political leaders in the Arab world, President Sadat and the Egyptian leaders, are willing to come and sit down and talk with Israel the way this military officer did yesterday? Uh, no. I think what uh, has been said is that uh, the United States and Russia together now will uh, are committed, according to the third uh, article of the Security Council resolution, that uh, there will be negotiations between the parties. But that's all you have, that piece of paper. This time, not, between uh, the parties. Not a promise. Well, I don't think they can promise, but that they both of them are committed to try to influence the two parties to get together, that is. Mrs. Mayor, you now hold a large number, perhaps 5,000 Arab prisoners of war, and they hold in turn a number of Israeli prisoners of war. What moves have you made so far to attempt an exchange? Well, uh, look, the situation is such that we haven't even received a list of the prisoners of war. Against all international conventions, we, are, we have thousands of prisoners of war, and we are giving them lists through the um, Red Cross constantly. We are treating the, um, the wounded. The Red Cross can visit the, the Egyptian or Syrian wounded soldiers, and they do. We did not receive a list of our prisoners of war to this day. The um, Red Cross was not allowed until this minute to visit our wounded men, either in Syria or in Egypt, and certainly they have not returned, released the wounded people, as it is uh, they're supposed to do according to the Geneva Convention. 
We have done all this. We are sending a batch of, I think, uh, 700 wounded prisoners. We're releasing them today. Uh, the Red Cross, uh, about, about 2,000 wounded prisoners. We're prepared to release them. But they must also perform their part of the convention. Will you move into negotiations with the Egyptians if this question isn't settled ahead of time? Uh, I'm now talking about peace negotiations. But we don't want to put up conditions of peace, whether there are peace negotiations or not. International law, international conventions have not been made only for Israel. Both sides must comply. Of course we want peace, but supposing there is no peace, and supposing Sadat does not want to uh, negotiate for peace, well, what about the International Convention which says exactly what should be done with the wounded the soldiers and Red Cross's uh, the position question? of Red Cross? This has nothing to do with is negotiations. Is this a political peace. diplomatic question, or is this something which might be suitable for discussion by the military officers who have been meeting? Or are they confining themselves strictly to the local issue of the Egyptian Third No, I, they, this question was raised by our representative. It will be raised in every at forum. At the military meeting? At any meeting. We cannot just uh, give up our, our men to the mercy of uh, Sadat or Assad. Mrs. Mayor, you, the way you talk, it appears that you don't consider peace negotiations an urgent question. How long can Israel go continue so, to win wars at this price? Really, I, I know that one must not judge the attitude of the one that asks the question, so <laughs> I don't think that that's really what you mean. It's not a question that we uh, are not anxious for peace negotiations. But we have lived with this for 25 years and before. So we say, yes, by all means, any day, any hour, anywhere, we are prepared to immediately go into peace negotiation, under auspices or under no auspices. But it doesn't mean that I can forget that there are men who are now in the hands of the Syrians and Egyptians. From past experience, we know exactly how these men are treated, some of them wounded, maybe some of them seriously wounded. And the other side does not live up to the Geneva Convention. Mrs. Mayor... This has nothing to do with peace negotiations. No, and I it does not mean that I, that I don't want peace negotiations. Mrs. Mayor, we've talked so far about, about uh, Egypt and the possibility of negotiations with them, and at least you have an initial contact. What about the other front? What about Syria? Uh, this has always been a more difficult nut to crack from Israel's point of view. Is there any prospect of negotiations with Syria? I don't know. Uh, I don't uh, even know whether... I don't imagine that uh, negotiations, if they start and when they start, and I hope they do as quickly as possible, that they will be with both parties together. As far as we're concerned, it's all right. We can meet in the morning with Egypt and in the afternoon with, uh, with Syria or vice versa. But uh, I suppose it will be handled one party at a time. Uh, be, I think it was uh, more is said about Egypt because it is accepted in the world, I don't know why, that the Egyptians are uh, more forthcoming. Have the Russians uh, undertaken to pressure Syria as they say they have Egypt into negotiating? I don't know whether they have undertaken to pressure anybody. Persuade, if you prefer. Oh, I think mainly Egypt. But really, I don't know, maybe they also Syria. But Syria has always taken a tougher stand at any rate. This is the first time that they agreed to uh, a, a Security Council resolution where the uh, 242 is mentioned and where negotiation between the parties is mentioned. They've agreed to it, so I hope they'll live up to it. In Can fact, there's something of a, a build-up on the Syrian front in the last... Um, several days. There have been additional Soviet tanks inserted into the lines. I think the Jordanian units there have been uh, uh, built up. Do you think that there's a uh, threat there of a renewal of fighting? I don't think so, but uh, we had no illusions. There was no doubt in, in uh, my mind nor in the mind of anybody that the Soviets have given up. They, uh, uh, they prepared I think they prepared this war in the same way as they prepared the 67 war. Uh, otherwise, how could you have an airlift and uh, the material arriving by boat practically in a few hours after uh, the war started? So good, even the Soviets are not. They can't fly boats. 
and but everything began coming in in, in massive uh, quantities and they're they've done it before they're doing it now there's no doubt in my can mind can you give me just one word I, i'm going back to a little bit of old history two weeks old i guess in israel is not very old but what happened at the beginning? Did Israel know there was going to be attack and take the calculated judgment that for political diplomatic reasons it would sustain the first attack? Yes. Mrs. Mayor, what was the basic reason uh, for that decision? Was it the fear of losing American arms aid? It wasn't only American arms aid. Of course, sir, we wanted this time. It was a calculated risk. Did you, I mean, did you, did you guess wrongly as to how badly it would hurt you? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how much more less we would have been hurt otherwise. But it was a calculated risk to the uh, extent that we did not want to create a situation where we will um, talk ourselves blue in the face, saying that we did not start the war, we did not cause the war, and friends who are not so friendly, and even our best friends will say, yes, if you only had not done that, we could have helped you more. Would you and, take that risk again? Um, it depends upon, I, I'm speaking now for myself. If this is taken into consideration in all the arrangements that have to be made, uh, we'll say, well, we paid for it, we suffered for it, but in the end, it balances well. But if we are treated as though we started the war, and as though we are responsible, then I don't know what we're How can you explain this lack of sympathy in the world for a country that was attacked? Uh, I don't think this is a sentimental world. But even when countries and governments deal, so say, realistically, and only on the basis of expediency, they don't understand, I think, and that may be an audacity on my part to say it, they don't understand how wrong they are. After all, we don't have to go back to ancient history. All this happened only about 30 years ago, when, uh, when people thought a big power was bigger than it is to now, United Kingdom, and a gentleman who I'm sure wanted peace in the world, uh, Mr. Chamberlain, said, well, look, this is what we have to weigh. Either we support Czechoslovakia or we have war. They gave up Czechoslovakia to Hitler and there was war. Mrs. Mir, let's go back to another bit of history. The question of Palestinian refugees has always been basic to the Middle East conflict. If you get into negotiations with any of the Arab countries, what, if anything, are you prepared to offer to settle this question? For refugees, there's there's no problem of a solution. If you're talking about refugees, they should have been out of the camps 20, 20 years ago. We almost we took out of the camps many refugees in the Gaza Strip since the Six Day War. But uh, there is room for the refugees in Jordan, and there is no doubt that if they want a peaceful solution. Jordan is the natural place for Palestinians if they want to live there. There are 20 uh, independent Arab countries, but if the Palestinians want to come to more of self-expression, there's no doubt that between Israel and Iraq, there will be one Arab state, that is Jordan, and that part, after we come to a peace agreement with Jordan, what is across the border of Israel, that's an Arab state, that's Jordan, they call it Palestine Jordan, Jordan Palestine doesn't make a bit of difference. Uh, Jordan always had uh, almost a majority of uh, former Palestinians. I presume when you're talking about Jordan now, you're not including what used to be called the West Bank of Jordan. No, I said definitely that when we come to a peace agreement with uh, Jordan, and there's a, uh, there's a line, there's a boundary, there's a border. What is across that border is Jordan, the East Bank, and if there will be anything else from the West Bank, that's Jordan. That's the home for the Palestinians. Jordan, in fact, has been the, the quiet border 
in this uh, war, although Jordanian units were involved up in Syria. How has that fact that you did not go directly to war as you did in 67 changed uh, your relations with Jordan and perhaps the prospects of negotiating a peace with them? Well, you know that since the Six-Day War, uh, the Jordanian border was open. There were open bridges, people coming and people going. And we didn't want to disrupt it uh, uh, five seconds before we absolutely have to. Now, this I, I know this is an, ab, uh, an abnormal situation. Here is a state with whom there is no peace. Uh, the borders are open. The bridges are open. He sends his tanks into Syria. Uh, his tanks join the fighting. There's no doubt that some of our men were uh, hit by his tanks. And yet we do nothing on the border because until the last moment, unless we have to, we want to make it possible that there is uh, some possibilities for peace. Isn't it even Can more you build peculiar? on that now? Pardon? Can you build on that now? Is there any, uh, or hope. has there been any contact with the... Um... Since the war? Yes. Yeah. Is there still trade or was that disrupted by the war? No, well, nothing was disrupted. So there was still trade with Jordan? Everything. Everything gets... So that uh, when Jordanian troops went north, uh, a lot of them were in trucks rolling on Israeli-made tires. Maybe. All right. Now, you mentioned... I don't know. I'm you mentioned... Not the tanks, really. Not the tanks, but the trucks. You mentioned before the question of suffering this attack. Um, the Institute for Strategic Studies in London estimates that you have suffered about 5,000 casualties. Is that way off the beam, dead and wounded? I think that's off the beam, but Is we it, suffered a lot. You suffered we less suffered, than that? Less than that, but we suffered a lot. Can you afford any more? How many more such victories can this country afford with its small population? Can we afford to live? I guess. Well, Mrs. Mayor, before the war, the Israeli policy seemed to be that the Arabs would not come to the negotiating table until they had literally nothing else to do, until they came out of desperation. Now one of the combatants has had some success, some small success. He has troops on your side of the Suez Canal, and there are perhaps prospects for negotiations. Does this indicate perhaps that the original theory was not correct? Uh, we, we are convinced that we will remain in this area and Egypt will remain in this area and all the other Arab, our neighbors. We are always looking forward to a possibility, to a hope that we will live together and we will cooperate. And there'll be real decent human relationship between our countries. Now, with that in mind, we don't want to make him feel that uh, he is frustrated, that he's been humiliated. We've never acted like that towards them. And uh, so he didn't have to go to war to prove that. His great victory in war is not so great. He, he did something on our side of the canal. We're on the other side. We've never been on the other side. Let me ask you about that, because I think that's very important in the time we have left. One of Israel's arguments has always been it must have secure and defensible borders. Mm -hmm. Where your ceasefire is now is hardly something that could be described as secure and defensible. It's a crazy quilt, a zigzag. Yes, of course. That's Isn't that a big incentive to negotiation? So we're prepared you? to negotiate. I mean, who needs the incentive? I want to tell you something. Uh, Sadat must, I think, must be given time to enjoy his defeat <laughs> and not to immediately, by political manipulation, turn that into a victory. Not because I want him defeated or humiliated, but for God's sake, he starts a war. Our people are killed. His and the many thousands are killed. And he has been defeated. And then... By a political uh, arrangement, he's handed a uh, victory and has become, or he thinks, has become a hero in the eyes of the Egyptian people. Does that help him? Are you afraid that's going to happen? I hope not. But uh, a few things have happened the last few days that make me worry. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mayor, for being with us today on Facebook. Today on Face the Nation, Golda Meir, the Prime Minister of Israel, was interviewed by Terence Smith of the New York Times. 
CBS News correspondent George Herman, and CBS News correspondent Tom Fenton. This half hour of Face the Nation was recorded earlier today at the Herzliya Studios in Israel. Stay tuned now for the second half hour of this special one-hour edition of Face the Nation with White House Chief of Staff General Alexander Haig. This is CBS. From Washington, D.C., Face the Nation, a spontaneous and unrehearsed news interview with the White House Chief of Staff General Alexander Haig. General Haig will be questioned by CBS News White House correspondent Robert Pierpoint, Helen Thomas, White House correspondent of United Press International, and CBS News White House correspondent Dan Rather. Face the Nation is produced by CBS News, which is solely responsible for the selection of today's guest and panel. General Haig, you've uh, talked of encouraging signs during the past 24 to 36 hours in the Middle East. But uh, if the detente with the Soviet Union is as solid as the President has been claiming, why was what some are calling nuclear brinksmanship required in the Middle East? Well, I wouldn't uh, characterize the uh, events of the uh, traumatic period you described as a nuclear confrontation in any sense of the word, Dan. And I think there's been some uh, misunderstanding uh, uh, with respect to the gravity of the situation. Uh, as you know, uh, the Secretary of State, in commenting on this in his press, sec uh, press conference, uh, pointed out that it was not indeed a, a serious confrontation in its uh, uh, degree of severity. On the other hand, uh, I think the President also clearly pointed out, and with total consistency, that the stakes involved in the Middle East, that is, the vital interests of both the United States and the Soviet Union in that context, uh, had the potential, had indeed the potential, for one of the most dangerous confrontations uh, since the 1962 missile crisis. And I think it's uh, important uh, that the American people and indeed the media understand that uh, while we were not in a confrontation configuration, the potential of a confrontation in that area of the world would indeed represent a matter of grave concern for the peace of the world. General, in the um, absence of any official announcement for many hours, was the President aware that many people in this country really thought that the troops were being called up to quell a, an internal disorder following on the tapes issue and, and the dramatic events of a week ago? No, Helen, I don't think that uh, any of us involved in the, uh, the very tense period uh, that you describe uh, thought for a moment that there would be any misinterpretation of where the problem area existed. For example, uh, the President convened a meeting of the bipartisan leadership uh, the morning of the alert, and it was discussed in detail with that leadership. There were no questions of the kind that you have just brought forth uh, with respect to the attitudes of the bipartisan leadership. I think they understood the problem for exactly what it was, a problem of great potential danger for world peace and for the American people. And uh, yeah, I was not aware of any of the kinds of concerns that you mentioned until Dr. Kissinger's press conference when I believe uh, Mr. Kalb raised that issue. It was not an issue that uh, any of our legislators uh, were concerned about when they were first confronted with the facts of the situation. General Haig, uh that issue uh, was raised by a number of people, not only Mr. Kalb, and perhaps one of the reasons it was raised, and I think uh, Dr. Kissinger himself indicated this, was that uh, strategists have expected the Soviet Union to probe this country because of the domestic weakness of this president. This is a problem that uh, perhaps most of us recognize. Now, uh, if you agree with that analysis, are we going to have to face a series of probes by the Soviet Union as long as the domestic crisis continues? Bob, I think it's uh, very important that we keep this whole issue in its proper perspective. There have been some ramblings on either side of extreme views. Uh, 
The first point I want to make is to reemphasize what the President said to the American people on Friday night and what I myself said uh, to the White House press corps on Monday. That is that the degree of turmoil in the body politic here in the United States uh, was certainly not a controlling factor in whatever actions the Soviets or ourselves or the combatants themselves might take in, in, a, in a situation of long-standing uh, difficulty. Uh, nations aren't dominated by these kinds of considerations, but rather their own vital interests. And I think that's precisely what has occurred in the Middle East. On the other hand, uh, I would also emphasize that when a nation, friend or foe, uh, calculates its relationships with the United States, it must take into account what it perceives as the unity, the durability, and the viability of our government. And in that context, uh, I do believe it's an important time in the juncture of this affair of Watergate for all Americans, indeed press included, to perceive most carefully the impact of their participation in the, in the evolution of events. And I would hope uh, that all of us would continually avoid what sometimes can be uh, uh, described as an overly intensified reaction to a particular event of the moment, which in a historic perspective is going to be precisely no more than that. Is that uh, a very nice and articulate way of saying that there are certain <laughs> questions you think we should not raise? Never. I think uh, uh, you know my attitude on these subjects, Bob. I think the press has uh, every right and indeed every obligation well, to ask hard questions. And we, in our part, have an obligation and an imperative to provide the answers to the press for the American people. General, didn't the uh, president really uh, precipitate uh, what you, the kind of thing, the reaction and so forth of last Saturday night, a week ago, when he fired Cox and uh, all of the ensuing reaction, which you said you miscalculated completely? My question now is, is the president and Congress on a collision course in the question of naming a new special prosecutor? And uh, what do you think uh, is going to happen? No, uh, I don't think uh, we're on a collision course, Helen, at all. There is a degree of partisanship involved in the, in the current panorama, and there's hardly any question about that. But let me say a word about uh, your reference to uh, our miscalculation of the events of, of Saturday night. I think uh, it's quite important uh, that all of us understand just what these events were, just what led up to uh, what I have described and some of your journalist friends have described as the firestorm of, of Saturday evening. As I pointed out uh, at a press briefing on Monday before the Washington Press Corps, uh, the weekend preceding this situation, the President concluded, and quite painfully, that the time had come for him to abandon, in this particular instance, his long-held conviction that he had a responsibility as the President of the United States to protect the prerogatives of this office, not only for himself, but for future presidents. But two events, two circumstances, led him to conclude that the time had come to put an end to what was now being described as an impending constitutional confrontation. These factors are this. First, there was a polarization occurring within our body politic. There were stories of, abroad to the effect that the, the Congress would hold the confirmation of Mr. Ford as new vice president in hostage to the Supreme Court determination of the tapes issue. This would be some four months in the future. Uh, there were suggestions made that if the president were to go against the Supreme Court decision, incidentally, a, a prediction that he's already made to the American people he would not do. But if he were to do that, we would then be in a position in which 
Mr. Ford would not have been confirmed, and the President would have been posed with an impeachable dilemma. And in effect, the mandate of the American people of past November would be replaced by placing the Speaker of the House in charge of the government. Now, recognizing that this is a view held by uh, a select few of, uh, of intense partisans, but recognizing also that the stage was being set for an increasing confrontation environment, the President felt that the time had come to make a Herculean effort to provide to both the courts and the Senate committee precisely what they had been asking for and, in other words, to remove the point of confrontation on this issue. Now, secondly, and I'm sure that the situation in the Middle East, which we have been following and the President has been following moment by moment since the October 6th battle started, that his realization that foreign leaders involved in this conflict could in some way have their own judgments influenced by the domestic situation and increasing tension and increasing fractionalization within our society on this issue, that it was to our international interest to try to solve and remove this problem. That is precisely what was attempted. And I must say that the collective judgments of Senator Stennis, of Senator Irwin, of Senator Baker, and of the Attorney General, the then Attorney General of the United States, was that this was a very fair and very just solution to this agonizing problem. Now, what was not anticipated, what was not anticipated by any of the participants in this negotiated settlement was the position taken by Professor Cox, in which he himself, for his own reasons, decided that he could not participate in this kind of a compromise. And rather than resigning, or perhaps uh, accepting it for the moment and waiting for the next issue to arise uh, uh, to have his view prevail, he chose instead, before the entire Washington press corps at 1 o'clock last Saturday, to challenge the President's order to him to cease and desist, not from obtaining the information which he had thus far claimed he needed, which was to be provided to him in this compromise, but rather to insist on a carte blanche ability in the future to demand further personal presidential tapes and memoranda covering presidential conversations. But General Haig, if uh, Special Prosecutor Cox or any other Special Prosecutor is to get to the bottom of Watergate and related crimes, doesn't he have to have the carte blanche to call for such things as White House logs and the kind of memoranda that Special Prosecutor Cox said that he it was an absolute necessity? Doesn't he have to have that kind of freedom? Uh, Dan, I'm glad you asked that question because I think there was some uh, bad misunderstanding that, uh, uh, coming out of Professor Cox's press conference. Uh, first, I want to make it very clear, as the Attorney General has, and as we have repeatedly, we've made a great deal of information and, and material available to uh, Professor Cox and his investigating team from the outset. Now, secondly, uh, I, think, I think the American people certainly got the impression that we've been intransigent on this issue since Professor Cox started his, his investigation. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, we have provided him uh, with, a, with a full array of documentary evidence. Where the President has taken issue with Professor Cox has been on the subject of those limited documents involving personal discussions by the President himself and memoranda covering the substance of those discussions. All of the other data has been provided. Now Professor Cox raised the question that he had never been able to get the logs of meetings between the President and Mr. Chapin and Mr. Hunt and Mr. Liddy and Mr. Strawn. Here again, 
Professor Cox knew very well there had been no such meetings, and he had been told that repeatedly by the President's counsel. And yet, the American people were led to believe on Saturday that for some reason these logs were not being made available. Well, for example, there were no logs. Well, uh, to, to get off the logs per se, for example, this very important conversation that took place in the President's office connected with the so-called milk deal, let's use the shorthand of the streets. Now, that was a specific conversation that occurred at a specific time. There had been some very serious questions raised about whether contributions by the milk industry were uh, given in exchange for limits on milk imports into this country. Now, that isn't a law. That's a specific conversation in which the President himself was involved. Now, that kind of memoranda, is that available to a special prosecutor? That kind of memoranda, uh, Dan, uh, if I were to, to answer your question, I would be uh, joining in a, uh, a, s a hypothesis which I would uh, very strongly reject. First, let me say something about the, the milk price decision. That was a decision made by the President uh, upon the recommendation of his staff and in coordination with the Congress. Uh, that was a decision that was made totally on those grounds and completely devoid of what I call external political pressure but it was opposed of the, kite, by the, the kind you referred to. Uh, now, secondly, there has been no request for any specific additional documents from Professor Cox, uh, which are in the area that you describe. So what we're dealing with here, and what a lot of the current anguish uh, is surrounding, is a hypothetical question, uh, which has not arisen. Now, as the President said on Friday, he is confident, and I am confident with a, d a reasonable degree of goodwill that all of the information that the next special prosecutor will require will be made available to, be to him in the form that is necessary for him to conduct his operations. General Haig. Under no circumstance would we ever be true to the preservation of the powers of the office of the president to uh, permit any investigator a fishing, free reigning fishing expedition into the vital discussions that occur in the President's office, and then uh, perhaps uh, to make whatever play of that he might seem there. Uh, General Hague, if I may yes, uh, review just uh, for a moment what you seem to have been saying, uh, the miscalculation that you yourself first brought up and uh, conceded yes. uh, now, as I understand it, is simply that. Uh, you and the President miscalculated what uh, Mr. Cox was going to say in reaction to being fired. Uh, you don't conceive that it was a miscalculation that uh, the Attorney General resigned and uh, his deputy resigned, that there was a, a storm of political criticism brought down on the head of the President. It seems to me that you've oversimplified this miscalculation to some extent. Are you really saying that the President was not aware that the country reacted very strongly against his actions? No, not at all, Bob. I think, uh, again, you're putting words in my mouth that uh, I would certainly not put there. Now, let me just again repeat. On Friday morning, the President of the United States, uh, the Attorney General, the President's legal counsel, and myself had concluded that we had a proposition, a compromise, if you will, that would have met the legitimate requirements of all parties. No one, least of all the President, anti anticipated that Professor Cox would reject the proposal in, in, in the sense that he did uh, reject it, and that is to, to publicly uh, confront the President with a, uh, a, a refusal to obey an order. But what now, I'm trying to get at is, are you people politically realistic? Do you understand that, Cox aside, the mm. President himself faces now a serious political crisis in this country? And well, it seems I'm, to me that you're dealing with it in a kind of an academic yeah, fashion, saying I that it's all going to go away. Uh, it's hard for anyone who is in the vortex of this uh, so-called storm you're describing uh, to deal with it in, in an academic fashion or to be oblivious to the kinds of pressures that have uh, developed, and least of all the President and least of all uh, me. Uh, what I do want to point out and emphasize very clearly is 
that what the president entered into was a very forthcoming and judged to be very fair outcome to a difficult situation. By whom? Now, by all of the responsible players in this particular confrontation, Are you saying with the that? exception of Professor Cox. Now, when Professor Cox determined to move against the directions of the president, it was then that the issue of Elliot Richardson's future tenure uh, first came into sharp uh, perspective. And he, for his own reasons, which uh, I understand, I don't necessarily share, but I certainly understand them, uh, decided that his own commitment, his personal commitment at the time of his confirmation before the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, required him, as a matter of conscience, not to be the instrument of the order to separate Professor Cox. General, that commitment was given to the Senate on behalf of the President, so it's the President's breach mm -hmm. of faith. But to get to the special prosecutor again, you don't see any conflict with Congress with both trying to name a special prosecutor and also, will a new special prosecutor have to pledge not to take the President to court if he needs more tapes, more memoranda, and so forth, in order to get the job, I mean? Well, first, uh let me not let your little zinger go by, uh, Helen, with respect to uh, the President's abrogation of uh, any commitment. Uh, we have, throughout this exercise, in full consultation with Attorney General Richardson uh, and the President's legal counsel, been extremely careful to ensure that no advice was given to the President which would place him in a position uh, contrary to the dictates of law. And we have yet to do so, and I think even Professor Cox has uh, expressed that very clearly. Now, with respect to the future prosecutor, we all recognize that this issue has become intensely political in character. And like any political issue, where the stakes are the goodwill and the understanding of the American people and indeed perhaps even the reins of power in this government, no issue of that character is going to be devoid of controversy and high-tension uh, struggle by the parties involved. And we expect this to be uh, a very partisan and a very difficult debate in the weeks ahead. But I am also confident that the American people who supported this administration and its objectives and goals will recognize the partisan character of this debate and that the steps that we will take in the, in the days and weeks ahead uh, to appoint a special prosecutor with the kind of independence the President described on Friday will more than meet the criteria which the American people will set for themselves. And I have great confidence in their you ability to come out correctly. still haven't answered the question, correctly. General. Right, will the new prosecutor have to pledge not to take the President to court? I don't think the new prosecutor uh, will have to make any pledge of any kind, uh, nor do I think he should, and if he were the type that would feel encumbered in that way, he's perhaps not the man that we would want. General, we're inside the uh, three minutes to go mark now. Right. I'd like to ask you whether the President agrees with the American Bar Association Board, which uh, in a rather what I was described to us as extraordinary meeting, agreed, I think, unanimously mm -hmm. that a special prosecutor should be appointed by the Congress. Mm -hmm. We, of course, welcome uh, the views of the uh, American Bar Association. We recognize the very keen views of uh, its current president, uh, and he's not been uh, the least bit adverse to, uh, to air them publicly in recent days. Uh, at the same time, uh, no president, no president uh, can run this great republic uh, by being the victim of a viewpoint of a particular uh, advocate of a particular point of view. And I don't think President Nixon is going to feel encumbered by that recommendation. Also, uh, General, earlier you... will not ignore it either. Sorry. Uh, you spoke of the, uh, what you considered to be, I think, uh, the intemperance of some of the reporting, uh, as the President did in his news conference the other mm -hmm. evening. And certainly no one would uh, argue with uh, yours and or the President's right to criticize the press. But the New York Times uh, says this morning, and I quote, the intemperance of President Nixon's news conference assault on the media in general, and on television in particular, did much to undermine the impression he was seeking to create of a president in full command of himself." End of quotation. Mm -hmm. 
Would you agree that that's a fair statement? Dan, I've been with this president for the past six months at, uh, in some very, very difficult situations. And I can assure you that the kinds of pressures uh, that impinge upon this president during this Middle East crisis, which have been really the dominant focus of his attention and of ours in the White House, uh, have been uh, matched by a degree of calm and leadership and decisiveness on the part of the president, uh, which every American citizen can be extremely proud and very confident that their government at this time is in good hands. Thank you, General Alexander Haig. Today on Face the Nation, General Alexander Haig was interviewed by CBS News correspondent Robert Pierpoint, Helen Thomas of United Press International, and a CBS News correspondent Dan Rather. Next week, another prominent figure in the news will face the nation. This broadcast was produced by CBS News.